United States. But to get back to the story. So John McCain does that. He stops the clock. He becomes the hero, and he reenacts by doing that, and he reinforces the very values that people were talking about that, that are ultimately going to decide this election. And they are the most impacted by this economy. We all think we're hurting. You know, oh, look, the stock market crashed. I lost a couple hundred grand. I lost 10,000 my retirement. No, these people have lost everything. If Hitler showed up tomorrow and said, look, the plant in Flint, we're going to open that up again. You're all going back to work. And the Arab guy who had the truck down the street with the coffee in it was there at the breaks. He's going to be out there. And the guy with the cleaning place down the corner where you drop uniforms off, he's going to be back there. And I'm going to do this all tomorrow morning. They'd say, yo, hit, let's go. This is ultimately about bread and butter issues. And the people that I'm talking about are bread and butter sensitive women in Europe. They have controlled American politics because of that. Their, 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 their sense about fairness has not to do with race, but it has to do with religion and anti-Catholic bias. And they're the ones to watch. So what are they going to do in this election? I don't know the answer. There are those who would say, well, it's kind of shocking, you know, that this is so close. Um, but I'm not shocked at all. If you look at the history of, of uh, elections where the presidential seat is vacant or about to be vacated, what you find is that these elections tend to be very close all the time. Look at Humphrey versus Nixon. That's a good one. Ford wasn't really the president. He was a standard. Ford to Carter. Okay? And what happens generally when there is controversial uh, issue, when there are controversial issues, or there is a crisis of some sort during that period of time, the numbers start to expand rather late. So you can bet, based upon that, that this is either going to be very close or very, very distant. And is race the ultimate the denominator? I don't think so, but I do think it has bearing. Why? Simple rule of something that Dr. King got from uh, from Gandhi and, and became very clear is that you know. Nobody minded beating up a thin Indian because um, who was talking about homespun cotton and all kinds of other things. What they minded was being caught, i.e. no one minds being a racist, they mind being found out. The beautiful thing about American voting, good news and bad news, is nobody knows what you're doing in there. So people act out their prejudices and always do, by the way, within that voting booth. Of that there is no question. Is that going to be enough to sway in the election? I don't think so. I think ultimately gets down to who's eating and who's not. So what does it have to do with the present moment? This financial system put into place um, and deregulated, um, if you read about global, the globalized economy and you do any thinking about it, you have to figure out that ultimately a $60 trillion world debt couldn't, couldn't, could not captivate or protect a $30 trillion world GDP. You don't have to be a great scientist to figure this out. The person, whether it is McCain or Obama, who stands up and calls for blood, because the people that I'm talking about are in pain, and they also don't want to bail out these gangsters. They think they're gangsters, okay? Even though, with, if there is no bailout of some sort, there'll be a disaster, but they don't want to bail out these gangsters with their money. Um, he who stands up first to talk for the bailout is he who's going to probably lose that election. Okay. Number one. Number two, it's kind of a Russian one. McCain sets himself up to be uh, General Polk, who was a successful president. And Obama, what, what Obama now has to catch up. And if you look at what's happened, very interesting. If all of these, if these events of the last few days are kind of like mini elections, like I said a moment ago, you know, elections closing and opening and closing, depending upon the controversy at the moment. Before the decision not to go to the debate, McCain was down nine in the AP in the in the Washington Post ABC poll. And then when he decided not to go to the debate, the numbers moved. And if you look at last night's overnight tracks, McCain is up by a point or two, which tells you something. There is no rational voter. <laughs> <laughs> this is ultimately about emotions that are dictated by the climate, the time the election occurs. <clears throat> so don't think that people are sitting there thinking, oh, well, this guy's got this, this guy's got that. No. People didn't vote against Al Smith to come full circle and I'm going to shut up and we'll have a dialogue. But people didn't vote against Al Smith in 1928 because they were rational and said, well, you know, he's got this and he's for, pro he's for ending prohibition. And this one's for keeping prohibition up. They voted against him because he was a captain. Okay? They didn't vote, they didn't vote for, uh, they, you know, you can, you can, this convolution of, uh, this, this, con this, uh, this kind of mixed beverage of American politics that includes race, religion, um, an economic, a hatred for economic elites, which I'm going to talk about in a second, has a lot to do with this. It still goes on. It kind of works, and somehow we get it to work every day with great difficulty. 
you say to yourself, well, why should he, going back to the notion of why should he even be close? If I'm right and economics dictate the argument, the Democrats should be way ahead, why is it close? Is it, and, it's, and I said, say it's not about race, and I'll tell you what it is. If you look at the history of Republicanism, and you look at the shift in Republican, the Republican Party over the last, let's say, go back to Nixon, what Nixon understood, and why he's such an important figure in American politics, forgetting Watergate, forgetting China, for example, and taking it back and putting it back back into, into play that he was the first real middle income president in the 20th century, without question. You look at him and say, what did he do that was so important? He understood the nature of division. Democrats and Republicans like that, well, I'm not divisive. Well, in fact, all politics is divisive, because 50% of the population is going to be on one side of the argument or the other. So this is nonsensical crap. What he understood as being, being divisive was to define who the elites were. Because the very strain of religion that I'm talking about, and the very strain of race, and that mixture, and, and economics, that somehow comes together to find American politics, Nixon understood better than anybody. What did he do? He went against the elites for the common man, which brings you to the present moment. And that's the dynamic he does. Why is McCain in play? Because he's now positioned himself as the protector of the common man, against the Congress, against Obama, and even against the president. That strain of, of populism that the Republicans have captured for their own has worked very well for them. So can they win this election? The answer is absolutely yes. And can the Democrats win the election? Absolutely yes. The question then becomes, who's got a better ideology? Shankoff, and my comment is it doesn't matter anymore. Because if you took both, if you took two balloons and painted faces on them, you'd have the Republican and Democratic Party. In fact, it is a mixed bag where people vote on personality characteristics based upon the very things I talked about a moment ago. So, your time. Yeah. Accepting, of course, the thesis about that small subgroup in the country that swings the election. I don't buy that. I don't think that any such thing exists. But, that is nonsense. But that's, that's, that's political reporters trying to find an easy cue to work it off of. But I'm interested in the, because of this, uh, this existential threat also that's external to the country but brought us 9-11, what I'm trying to understand if it's been polled is where does the country come out from coast to coast? Uh, those who is take, interesting, by the way, you enjoying this? Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, those yeah. who take more a kumbaya approach, talk to everybody, maybe you'll convince someone, or the real politic approach that there is a redeemable evil and some people you just don't deal with, you have to give them up all tomatoes. Where's most of the That's the very I know where, I know where your, the vote you described is, he's over here. But where, where does the country break? I'm, I'm trying to be down the middle about this and be analytical. I am a Democrat of some note, who, without question, I'm pretty pretty well regarded in my own field of expertise. I would suggest that that what you're talking about is religion, and not not pragmatic politics. If you uh, if you look at this country's history of entrance into war, what you find is that you know even going back to the revolution, it was not an easy stretch for people to want to go to war. They have to wait for some external attack. And if you take that forward into the TV age, I'll give you an example. Jim McGreevy gets in trouble, right? And I'll tell you how it's relevant. I get the phone call that morning. It was among the best mornings of my life. The phone rings. 8 o'clock in the morning. The governor's gay. He's coming to the closet at 4 o'clock press conference. They're trying to extort $50 million out of him. We need you in Princeton in an hour. I mean, this is a call you get every morning. You know what I mean? Can't wait. I call up my best friend, straight, you know, gay, who cares? He's straight, happy. I said, McGreevy called me, he's in trouble, he needs me. He needs me, and the governor needs me. He says, what did he need you for? But so it goes. Um, <laughs> so we go through the whole day. It's a great morning. I get him, we get to, I'm listening. So I go, in, I'm, oh, this is an interesting side story of history. So I get him, I get there to get the drunk whack at the governor's mansion. Go inside, I sit down, the governor says, Hank, welcome. I said, thank you. He said, uh, you want to know what we've been talking about? No, I said, I want to listen. I listened for half an hour. He said, I said, I'm ready to talk. I said, you're leaving, announcing the time to leave, when you're leaving today. He said, why is that? I said, because you don't get out of here. You, you don't announce it, you're going to go to jail. Okay, it's going to come to an end. The FBI is going to be in here. It's going to be terrible. I said, you're leaving today, blah, blah, blah. Finally, the end of the conversation, I don't have to bore you with all the details. He says, do you think this is going to be big news? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, go. You know, I've been at this for a long time. And I said, I think this is going to be real big news. He says, are you sure? I'm sure. I said, you want to know what the top of the six, the six o'clock news is going to look like? I said, sure. I said, well, here's the top of the six. 
20, and this will make my point, 25 murdered in Fallujah, and now the news. New Jersey's governor says he's...